Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I wanted to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their monthly donations help make Backyard Ecology possible. If you would like to join them, please visit my Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash Backyard Ecology. Also, if you would like more Backyard Ecology, please check out my blog. The blog profiles common native plants, spotlights pollinators and wildlife that you are likely to see around your home, and offers tips for attracting pollinators and wildlife to your yard. To make sure that you don't miss out on any of the blogs, podcasts, or other Backyard Ecology news, I send a free Backyard Ecology email once a week to anyone who has subscribed to our email list. I'll have links in the show notes for the Backyard Ecology Patreon page, blog, and email list. One last thing before I introduce today's guest. If you are listening to this episode before June 12, 2022, then don't forget that I am doing a survey asking for your feedback about the Backyard Ecology podcast. You can find all of the details, including a link to the survey, in episode 50. If you take the survey, you'll have the opportunity to enter a drawing for one of five copies of my newest book. But the survey closes on June 12th, so don't wait too long if you want to participate. Today we're talking with Dr. Kim Clary Sandler. Kim is a professor of biology education at Middle Tennessee State University and co-director of the Center for Cedar Glade Studies. Glades are ecosystems where the soils are really shallow and rocky, often with patches of rock showing on the surface. They can be found all over the world, including multiple states within the eastern U.S. Glades are unique areas that support some really interesting and sometimes highly specialized or even rare organisms. Now, admittedly, they can also be frustrating for homeowners who may have one in their yard and be trying to force it to conform to the standards of a normal yard because they think something is wrong with that area. However, sometimes all it takes is discovering that there isn't anything wrong with that area at all, but instead it is something special and can be celebrated for its own uniqueness. There are many different types of glades based on the type of rock found in the glade. Much of Kim and my conversation focuses on limestone glades, or what in some areas are more commonly known as cedar glades. As you might suspect, the primary rock in these glades is limestone. However, we also touch on a few other types of glades, and the basic concepts that we talk about can be applied to pretty much any type of glade. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Hi, Kim. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hi, Shannon. I'm just honored that you contacted me, and I'm excited to uh talk a little bit more about uh, Middle Tennessee Cedar Glades. Yes, I am very excited about this too and looking forward to this conversation because glades are such unique and interesting ecosystems. And I think there's a lot of people that don't know that they exist. And that's even if they've got glades nearby or maybe in their yards or next to their driveway because I've met people like that before. Yes, that's true. And, you know, I've qualified Middle Tennessee cedar glades because those are the glades I'm most familiar. But glades occur primarily, um, well, really, they're they're glady type areas all over the world. And let's just back up. What is a glade anyway? Yes. Well, a glade would be a a clearing or a, a grassy area is really what a glade is. And in reference to the cedar glades that I think more about is uh, our uh, limestone cedar glades. And, but they're cedar glades that are comprised of dolomite and then glades that are made up of other type of rock um, composition. And so if you think about uh, the way that this was described to me before I had ever seen a glade is think about a glade like a room where the floor of the room, that's the glade. And then the walls of the room would be, in our case, would be the cedar trees, which are not true cedars. There are no true cedars in 
this part of the country, they're actually junipers. And the junipers are not rare or unique. They actually have the adaptive capability to grow their roots deep into these fissures that develop in the limestone rock. So thinking about a glade is the clearing, the floor of the room, and then the walls would be the surrounding, in, in our case, would be cedar trees and also woodlands as well. I like that. And like you said, there are glades found throughout the world, but since we're mostly focused kind of on the eastern U.S., I mean, they're all throughout here, really. I mean, multiple different states throughout the eastern U.S. have glades in them. And glades are often defined by the type of rock that you're mainly finding. So that's right. In our area, we're talking limestone a lot. That's exactly right. And in uh, northern Alabama, in um, northwest Georgia, southern Kentucky, we, you know, we definitely share some of the same um, type of rock strata. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting, though, here in Middle Tennessee is that we are um, thinking about cedar glades that are in uh, what we refer to as the central basin. And Tennessee, of course, is just the most amazing state because we, on the west, we straddle the Mississippi River, and then to the right, we have, uh, you know, the Appalachian Mountains. And then so in the middle, here is this thumbprint into the state, the central basin. And geologically, the, the glades, the limestone glades, I've been told it's some of the oldest rock in the area. The oldest is actually uh, in igneous rock, which is about a billion years old, which is in the, the Appalachian Mountains. But we still have some pretty darn old rock that's exposed in our, in our cedar glades. And people don't think about um, these rocky places as, as being important, but they really are because they're home to some highly specialized and adapted uh, organisms. It's so exciting to talk about them. Oh, yes, it is. And I want to talk about some of those animals and the plants and stuff in a second. But for people in other parts of the eastern U.S., I want to point out that, yes, we're going to talk a lot about limestone glades because that's where you're located at is on these limestone glades. And that's really what I'm most familiar with too, because of the geology here. But you can also have shale glades and dolomite glades and sandstone glades and chert glades. So it really kind of comes down to what your bedrock in the area is like. But still the idea of glades, the plants may change because the rocks change the chemistry of the soil. So if you're on these different other types of glades, you may have different plants. But the idea of glades, the concept of glades is really going to be very similar. No matter what type of glade you're on, just change the details a little bit. And that is true. And, and each of them have, each and all of these glades have, again, have these specialized organisms that have the capability to survive there. Mm -hmm. and have, you know, just wonderful things to look at and to think about as well. Okay, so let's kind of characterize glades a little bit more to give our listeners a little bit of a better idea. So the way I think about it is I'll look out and if it's like bare rock with just little bitty pockets of plants growing here and there, usually kind of lower growing plants, that's obviously a glade to me. I mean, it's primarily rock is what you're seeing on the ground. It is. But there's also kind of the in-between where you've got these really thin soils that are, it's soil, but the rock's like right underneath and how far underneath, whether it's just like an inch or two versus eight inches or a foot, some of those are still glades. So where do you draw this line? That's such a, a good way uh, to really think about them. My um, friend and major professor, Dr. Thomas Hemmerley, he, he studied under Dr. Elsie Dr. Quarterman, who was a, prof a professor emerita at Vanderbilt University. And, and we give her credit with really bringing the Cedar Glades into view. She and, and her students, they studied 
the glades, she studied that as part of her dissertation. My um, major professor, Tom Hammerley, what he did is he developed this really neat um, kind of cartoon drawing that displayed what one would think of, just what you were describing, these different soil depths as the zones. And Elsie um, actually did this as well in her dissertation because it's hard to sort of make sense about, wait, what? And sure, we've got these, what we call these rock outcroppings and the topography is karst. So that means karst, K-A-R-S-T. So it's, it's limestone. And of course, rainwater is a little bit acidic and it begins dissolving away that, that rock and creates, of course, these pockets and then the heating and the cooling and creates fissures so that um, there's all these irregular depths of soil. And yet plants can only get as tall as their roots can go deep or spread, if you will. So just as you had said, uh, around these really rocky places, the plants are actually small and they, you know, and they got to be able to, uh, to, to grow and produce seeds before, this is the other situation that exists in glades, before there's no more water. Because the summers are, gosh, are, it's, it's been said that the temperature in glades, they're about 10 degrees hotter than anywhere else in the surrounding area. And yet you've got these real extremes because the winter is cool and wet. So you can imagine if you've just got two inches of soil and you're a little plant, uh, then you've got to grow fast and, you know, literally make your hay while the sun shines and there's enough moisture so that your roots don't dry out. So that these plants, they're, they've adapted to this incredible uh, condition of really, really wet winters and then these really dry, hot summers that go on and on and on, you know, literally baking on a rock all summer. And yet, you know, the, they come back, the little annuals, they'll, you know, they come back the next year. Yes. And I will definitely say they can get very hot compared to the surrounding area. I was just in Arkansas last week and was visiting some glade areas and it was a hot day anyway. And then we got out on the glades and especially the solid glades, like the rocky area. Oh my gosh, we were baking and we quickly retreated to some of the side areas where there was a little bit of shade coming from the nearby woodlands and stuff, because it was just so hot. Yeah, and so that's what Hammerley and Quarterman, that was, that was their model. So a, a zone one would be the bare rock. And you know, you think, oh my gosh, well, nothing's gonna grow on that. Well, it turns out there are organisms that will live on that rock. And, and you know, going back to ecology 101 is our, you know, our first pioneer. So there's lichen that will um, occur on the rock. There's a, a blue-green bacterium uh, called, well, we call, common name, actually the genus is Nostoc and common name around here is witch's butter. And it also will hang out on the rock. And it's just amazing to think that anything could survive on the rock. So that's zone one. And then we've got zone two where the soil is just two inches deep. And then zone three, which would be, well, zone two, we call that the gravelly glades. And then zone three, you know, a little bit deeper soil. Those are the grassy glades. And that would support, of course, the perennial grasses is what we're talking about. So the soil's just deep enough that uh, their rhizomes don't die over the wet winters and, you know, they're able to survive through the hot summers. And then a zone four would be the shrubby zone, deeper soil, and then zone five and six would be where we see the, the junipers and then the hardwoods. And it, um, there's been some work to support this idea you know, we're talking in a linear fashion, um, but that there's only specific species that occur, say, in a zone three. Well, that hasn't been supported research-wise, but, you know, if you're teaching people about this, it's easy to get your head into this idea of the zones, and obviously a zone two plant, like a little Nashville mustard, they only get to be two inches tall. It's really hard for them to compete for sunlight if they're over there in a zone four. Do they occur in deeper soil? Of course, but guess what? 
the plants that occur in the zone four, they cannot live in a zone two. They can't live in two inches. So I guess it goes one way, but not the other. So it's interesting to think about that. It makes it fun too, to go and explore and find these highly adapted um, plants. Oh yes, definitely. And yeah, like you were saying, there are some really specialized ones and Oh my gosh, the lichen community on that bare rock zone is just, oh my gosh, it is amazing. All the different kinds you can see there. Oh, they're, they're beautiful. And then there's um, like a lichen, uh, the crypto, I think it's pronounced crypto gametic uh, crust that, you know, to me, it looked like droppings that there were, you know, animal droppings or just a big pile of animal droppings that are just kind of all fused together. That's alive. That is a living organism too. And oh my goodness, it's just, it's fascinating. And there was one that I kept seeing where we were at that it was orange and it looked like the rock had rusted Yes, on the corners. And, and it's like, okay, no, that it, that's not an iron-based rock, it did not rust, but it looked like it rusted because of the way the orange lichen was. Yes, yeah, it is. It's so extraordinary. And, you know, people, oh gosh, it's just a rock out there. Who cares about a rock? But I challenge you to get down on your hands and knees and just look closely at what's going on, particularly in our rocks here in Middle Tennessee and these, the, the Lebanon limestone rocks, they're full of fossils. And the bodies of these once living marine organisms actually are what make up, that's the composition of the limestone rock and just wonderful different types of fossils you can find. And of course, kids wanna know, are there any dinosaurs? No, the seas, unfortunately, they were shallow. But, um, and how do we know that? Well, we know that by the kinds of fossils that we find. So we don't find any big marine organisms in there, but you know, we do find a lot of shelled uh, species of organisms and um, oh, sponges and you know, things like that that would have benefited from being in a shallow sea, probably warm as well. Yeah, let's talk about some of those animals and the plants that we might find that are really cool and unique to these glade areas? Well, the, the animals regretfully have not been studied as well. And, and, you know, you talk about an environment that is really, really hot in the summertime. And if there's not any cover to get under, you literally, you know, you're roasting in an oven. And the animal population, it seems to be more transitory, just passing through. Although there is a salamander, the streamside salamander has been um, found to specifically like these temporary little uh, rivers, if you will, or, or little, little tiny temporary streams that occur in cedar glades. It prefers those and uh, has been found to be of um, you know, ecological significance because of that. And uh, the little tiny prairie warbler, you'll, you know, you'll see that, hear the song and see the prairie warbler and fence lizards. And of course, you know, you think about hot and dry, probably you're thinking like me, you know, the reptiles have been studied as well. And, um, you know, all different kinds of snakes have, have been found. I was hiking with a, a colleague, um, John Froshauer, who's now retired with um, the Department of Environment and Conservation. And we had a big group of people with us from all over the country. It was a science teachers meeting, and this was one of the field trips. And somebody looked down and there was a bright red little tiny snake that nobody stepped on. And it was a little scarlet snake that was just beautiful and calm and docile. And, you know, we ooh ah over that little snake that, you know, there you go. You're out here in this rocky, dry environment. And, you know, here's this beautiful animal, just calm and, mm -hmm. you know, pick up a bowl. <laughs> you know, we all said hello, <laughs> put the snake back down and we went on our way. So um, the, the animals I'm not really as familiar with. I, you know, there, I've seen spiders and, oh my goodness, scorpions. 
we don't have scorpions like they do out west, but you know, at the size of your pinky fingernail, just adorable. And then in these temporary ponds, and sometimes there'll be farm ponds as well that will be adjacent to glaze. You know, there's toads and um, and tur box turtles and you know animals like that that you'll find. And then the just passing through, you know, the the herbivores, you'll see that that they've been there as well. Yeah, and of course, when you get into the areas that can support the wildflowers and stuff like that, then you get the pollinators or the grasshoppers and all those different, really cool, fun insects that come through. Yes, it's so true. And there was a study done, I guess, by uh, uh, Jerry and Carol Baskin, who were students of Elsie Quarterman. And they had documented that the majority of the, the these cool plants that we can just, will identify them as endemic, which means that they occur in the particular glades that we're thinking more about, um, these endemic flower species, they're insect pollinated. And you're right. I mean, we always overlook insects and I just nearly did that. So thanks for bringing that to bear. How important our animal friends, the insects are as well. And yet there's so much that we don't know. And we actually have a student doing a study right now to evaluate more about a particular uh, endemic plant of the glades. I think she's working with the Tennessee milk vetch, which is, get this name, Astragalus tennesseensis. And so it is, you know, they're trying to do a little bit more research as far as that particular plant species. And Shannon, we've got our poster child. We've actually got a couple. One of them, uh, unique to Rutherford County, is Pines Ground Plum. And Pines Ground Plum has a really cool story. It was identified in the late 1800s based on herbarium specimens. And I, I don't know how that was documented or where, where those data came from because most everything I think was housed either um, at Vanderbilt or at UT and the UT herbarium burned. And so a lot of the work that had been compiled you know, went up literally up in flames but so it had been reported it hadn't been known for about a hundred years and a friend of mine um, Milo Pine he and his parents were you know out looking at plants and he wasn't a qualified botanist he just really liked to think a lot about plants and he saw this plant that had these bright red fruits like a red flame grape and exactly the same size and he just knew right away it was nothing he'd ever seen before. And so he followed up um, to document that with uh, Dr. Barnaby, who was an expert on this particular species. So it, it's, a, it's in the bean family, it's a legume. It's in the genus Astragalus, just like Astragalus tennesseensis, Tennessee milk fetch. This is also an Astragalus. And yet it was new to science and um, and so when uh, Dr. Barnaby came to Middle Tennessee, he cut open one of those pods and he immediately said, this is new. This is nothing we've ever seen before. Isn't that cool? That is. And I mean, it shows that there's so much more to be discovered and documented and just how much of a difference anybody can make just by being curious. Yes, just by being curious. Yeah, and Milo didn't, have, he did subsequently go on and get a degree. And he um, ended up, he worked for the state as a botanist and then for Nature Serve for many years. He just recently retired as a botanist. And I think he's the number one poster on iNaturalist. Like he has something like 6,600 photographs and identifications on iNaturalist. So he does have a claim to fame. Um, but he, having a plant named after him, the common name, but the, the species is Bilbulatus because it has to do with the way that the seed pod uh, was organized. And it is amazing because the, uh, the Pines ground plum, the occurrence of it is restricted as best as we can tell to Rutherford County. And just coming back to what you said, Shannon, it's just, just take a closer look. You never know what you're going to find. And, you know, be curious. I take um, students, I take 
uh, elementary, I'll, any, I'll take anybody out to the Cedar Glades. I love going out there and ooh with somebody. And I had a group of high school kids that, you know, you didn't even think they were paying attention. It's just like, okay, here we go again. But they had so much fun. And, but a, um, a female student, she's like, hey, you know that, that purple plant back there, I have that in my backyard. And I'm like, oh, mm, no, no, I don't think you do, but thank you. And she said, no, no, I do. I live right around here. And I'm like, oh, you live around here? She said, yeah. And so I connected her up with the Missouri Botanical Garden who was documenting the Pines Ground Plum populations. Yes, she had Pines Ground Plum and it was a new population that had never been reported before. Wow. <laughs> That is amazing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So she actually was an artist and knew very well. She looked closely and could tell those are the plants that I have in my backyard. And it, you know, was um, so cool because it, the plant is federally listed as endangered. Yeah. Which is why I think it's so important to have conversations like this because so often there's the opportunity to have something really cool in your yard, I mean, even if you're in town or near town in suburbia, you can still have these patches. I mean, a lot of the area that you're talking about is Metro Nashville area. I mean, it's not far from really big town city. And yes, I've had people from greater Nashville area come to me and say, hey, what's this plant? Or start describing something to me. And I'm like, you've got a glades area you've got a glades plant there and it's really cool because unless you know about glades you're not going to recognize what you have because we don't know what we don't know I mean that's just the basics for anything that is so true and that brings to mind another really this is this is a conservation success story I'm getting ready to share and Dr. Elsie Quarterman and a student they you know botanist we're out we're always out cruising around looking for places to investigate and notice this beautiful hot pink color and they pulled the car over and sure enough it was a coneflower bright beautiful pink something so different about this coneflower though is picture this windy day you've got an umbrella and the umbrella the wind blows the umbrella inside out so instead of the umbrella float, you know, flanking downward, it goes the other way. Well, this is how the petals were growing on the coneflower, completely opposite. When you think of a coneflower, you think of an umbrella, you know, uh -huh. the, the cone, the central portion, and then the, the petals droop down quite beautifully. No, this is exactly the opposite. The petals, they reflect upward. And again, curious, knew something. This was something very, very different. And subsequently, it was um, the Tennessee coneflower, which was the first federally listed plant in the state of Tennessee. And I believe that was in 1979 was when it was officially listed. And my um, coming back to Dr. Tom Hemmerley, his dissertation was to study the life history of this plant. And where did it go? Apparently, it went under Percy Priest Lake for what they could figure. And um, so it was thought to be extinct. Here it is. It's back in the picture. And the consequence of um, Tom Hammerley's work is once we knew how the plant grew, how it propagated itself, then propagation uh, work was able to be done. The plant was able, it doesn't transplant very well if you dig it up, but if you grow it in a setting where it's not around any other coneflowers because it likes to date, it has to be grown where it's isolated. Um, it would easily, uh, it could be planted and until the 40 years later, it was released out of being listed as, as endangered and now it's just listed, listed as um, threatened. And so, you know, it's like bad, bad, bad. The news is all bad, bad, bad. No, it's not always all bad. This is a good example of multiple agencies working together with the research uh, in a coordinated fashion with this um, 
systematic approach to what it is that they were going to do and uh, and bringing a plant basically into recovery, which I think is we need to talk more about that and provide some hope for our future. This can be done. Yeah. Going on the endangered species list doesn't have to be the end all. Yes, it does. Yeah. We can come back. It just maybe not with everything, but there's that opportunity for some, especially to be able to, like you said, go from endangered to threatened to maybe eventually not listed at all, which is really amazing and awesome. It really is. We often, and I say we, my um, co-director colleague, Dr. Jeffrey Walk, we're often contacted by people to come and look at their property and, and, you know, and there's just a limit to what we can do with that. But it is, you know, it's, it's exciting to us that people care enough to, Hey, could you come check this out? I, you know, I've got this, I have these limestone rocks, you know, obviously we can't farm on this. We can't plant anything on it. Is there anything special here? And and I think that gets back to what we were talking about, about, you know, hey, just be curious. And with so many wonderful plant identification programs now out there, iNaturalist would be one where you can take a photograph of it and try and search through the database to see if you can um, find an identification for that specific plant. And, um, you know, and maybe it's, it's not rare, but it's just something that you learned about it. And now you know, and you can enjoy it and study the seasons that it blooms and produces seeds and who pollinates it or, or maybe who eats it too. So, yes, exactly. And talking about being curious, I just realized something that we haven't brought up that I think a lot of people will probably be curious about. Why don't these limestone glades or the cedar glades or any type of glades, whether it's sandstone or chert or limestone in our case, why don't they have soils? And, and really, you know, why do they exist at all? Is yes. Think about what you've learned about succession. And, you know, we talked about the lichens and soil building processes. So there's a couple of factors that enter into this. One is, as you said, so you've got, you've got the, the rock very, very near to the surface and there's nothing around that will create soil. And we have interfered with the process that actually prevents any organisms from being around. I don't know if I'm saying this. So let's talk about the walls of the room again. So the walls of the room, the cedar trees, of course they live, they die, they deposit um, you know, their needles and, and the, you know, the fleshy cones, et cetera, et cetera. But blades have existed because of fire. And so this is a system that is, it's essentially, it's fire adapted. And we have suppressed fire in glade. So consequence of that, along with excessive development, we have, um, you know, glades are, we're losing, I guess, NOS at L uh, said 95% of glades are actually gone. And so if we can't burn them, what can we do? And so with the Department of Environment and Conservation and the Natural Heritage Program, what they're doing is attempting to burn small portions of them and come in with real specific machinery that chums up, literally chews up, breaks up, and turns uh, that, that organic matter that's encroaching on the glades into like mulch, let it dry, and then they go back in and they do a very controlled burn. And so the idea is, is I mean, I like to think of them now as the un-cedar glades or the not-cedar glades because the cedars are actually a problem and they weren't a problem for glades because fire would take care of them. And, you know, they're, they just, you know, they're, they're like candles. They ignite instantly and go up in flames and, you know, and bye-bye cedar. The other thing that maintains glades, so, so fire. The other thing is, is that you'll notice they're gently sloped. So you've got these unstable soils or light soils. And again, you know, we know that we have these rains that come through. So the, the rain, of course, would move the soil off the rock. But so primarily fire and um, 
and the slope. So gentle, a gentle slope is really important. And then the irregular strata of the rocks themselves, you know, so the fissures in the rocks and the, um, you know, just the slight movement of the rock that, you know, of course, let's talk. The central basin was actually a, a dome on two different occasions, but the, the upheaval from the east, the mountain building processes created, you know, this kind of this big dome that then started to break down, fractured, opened up, and then eroded away. And that happened on two different occasions. So just the activity of the rock itself. Yeah. And, you know, Shannon, one thing we didn't talk about too is what's beneath the glades. I mean, underneath that rock, phenomenal cave system. Yeah, especially in some areas. Like you said, with us, it's limestone. So yes, definitely that. I don't know enough about glades in other areas to know if the same thing happens in those other types of glades. Because I mean, where I'm at in central Kentucky, we're very karst, very limestone based. We've got the, the same sorts of things that you've got there in middle Tennessee, as far as the bedrock and stuff. And this is where I never really got into geology when I was in college and stuff. But the longer I play in ecology and learn and just the older I get, the more I'm like, oh, geology really is important for understanding the biology. And nobody ever really made that connection or I didn't make that connection when I was younger. But I wish now that I did because I'm seeing all these areas that it plays in. But that's just more for me to be curious about and learn now. It is. And, and I'm in there with you as well. I never had a geology course when I was, you know, coming through my college curriculum or even graduate school. And it would have been so helpful. And I'm always in awe of the soil classification system that they use and, and actually the naming. I mean, how do they have so many, they probably think that about it plants and animals, but just the naming system that they have is, is really amazing as well. But it certainly is true that the, the composition of the rocks determines the composition of the soil, which determines, of course, the plants, which determines the animal community. And it's totally all related to each other, isn't it? Oh, yes, definitely. And I'm learning more and more. I mean, how interrelated they are too. So we've talked about how people have these in their yards and in their communities. And I know a question that I get asked a lot with my nursery, especially, is I'll have people say, I've got these really thin, rocky soils. I can't get anything to grow there. Or what do I do with this? So if you've got these thinner soils, these rockier areas, what do you do? If they're in your yard, I mean, what can you do with them? So it's entirely possible that whatever you're trying to get grow to get to grow in that particular place can't because it hasn't it doesn't have the correct adaptive features. But you can find, like yourself, Shannon, you can find people who have native nurseries and ask them what you know what could I plant here. Um, you could uh, look for you know, plant rescue events, those kinds of things do happen. And you, you can consult with, with, you know, universities around you to see if, you know, anybody could come out and help you figure out um, what it is that you could plant there. And, um, and sometimes it may be you just don't do anything. <laughs> you just let nature take its course, because perhaps there was um, herbicide spraying that was done or something that actually interfered with the ability of the native uh, plants to um, to recover. And I would say too with that, that a big piece is if you have one in these areas that is a natural glade or glade-like area. So you have those rock formations, you have those thinner soils, the rockier soils and stuff like that. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to bring in dirt and make the dirt thicker, better, or what is in our mind usually better, having those deeper soils. It's a lot of picking plants that actually are adapted to that. 
not all of our plants need the deep soils and not everything that we have needs to have that. Now, there are some areas that have been heavily impacted where everything's been scraped away. So it wouldn't be a glade, but now we've got these shallow soils because just development. And so, okay, that's not a glade, but maybe you can work with glade-like plants because it's kind of an artificial situation, but especially if you've got a glade, don't try and force it to be something else. Work with your glade. Yes, don't try and unglade it. <laughs> yes, that'd be one. That's one thing that I try and talk to people a lot about is celebrate what you've got. Yeah, and and I've seen, um, you know, some homeowners have you know huge huge patches of this rock in their yard and. And they were able to purchase the property inexpensively because of that, because you'll never be able to put a, a yard in there. And, uh, and they were happy not to, it was less grass to cut. <laughs> and so if you're one of those, hooray for you, you get to, uh, you know, to celebrate glades. But I, I agree with you, Shannon, I would never, you know, going in and porting rock underneath that bedrock, it's just ultimately it's going to erode away, particularly if you have a sloping situation or you don't have some way to, to prevent that from happening. And the, the thing about not doing anything, I, I'd like to come back to that. We have a lot of plants that have been introduced to this country intentionally and unintentionally. And there are plants that are unwanted, we call invasive exotic plants. And if you have a lot of those, of course, how are you gonna know if you, if you Google invasive plant species, you'll have a whole list of what these are with, with images of them. I would highly recommend removing those because these are uninvited guests that are successful in our environment because they don't have any competition or they're able to make a bunch of seeds quickly, they, and they reproduce rapidly, and consequently they spread rapidly as well. So when I say leave it alone, leave it alone so that it's a glade again, but remove any invasive species that are also hovering around the scene as well. Yes, and with that, your invasive species list is going to change state by state because we've all got different soils, we've all got different climates and, and all that changes what can grow or how well it can grow in an area. So yeah, Google your state and then invasive species. You can usually get a pretty good list there. The lists are usually updated every 10-ish years or so. Invasive plant, plant species. Yes. There are, there are invasive animal species as well. And unfortunately, both of those lists and are growing longer, <laughs> longer yes. by the day. <laughs> oh yes, there's all kinds of different invasive animals and fungi and plants, but yeah, invasive plant species will get you the ones that you need to clear out of your yard or your property, whether you've got a glade or woods or prairie or anything like that. And don't assume that just because you can buy it in the stores, means that it's not invasive. There are a lot of invasive species that are still sold today, which is another whole story that and conversation that we could have that we're not going to go into right now. That would be another podcast that you could do. Oh, yes, that would definitely be one. But yes, I mean, we've covered quite a bit here and this has been really fun. And oh, one more thing, because this is something that I just, I never really put it together, never really thought about it, um, but just discovered, like I said, a couple of weeks ago when I was at a glade in Arkansas, we were talking about how things are really wet during the winter and during the spring, and then they dry up really hard. Some of that, especially in those areas that stay a little bit wetter, longer, you can have some really, really amazing cool plants there um like sundews i mean i never really thought of sundews the carnivorous plants as being glade species but there were sundews there and that was just amazing because 
not only were there sendus, and that was the first time I've ever seen sendus in the wild and known what I was looking at, at least, it was in bloom. And to see the sundews in bloom was really amazing. So yes, there can be all kinds of cool, fun things in these glades. That is amazing. That really is. And I'm thinking about, uh, we've got a little tiny, it's, it's called Sunny Bell Lily. And in here in Middle Tennessee, around Nashville, there was a bypass that was built 840. And the bypass was routed around a population of sunny bells, which they like their feet really, really wet. But when they bloom, oh my goodness, they bloom in such profusion. It's like a, just a yellow, beautiful, and I'm not talking about a field of ranunculus buttercups. It's just this beautiful cascade of yellow to behold. I mean, really in abundance. But that's right. And I think that uh, Dr. Dwayne Estes has been thinking a lot about the wetland aspect to glades and that the, you know, the standing water does qualify some regions of glades as wetlands, which brings about a whole other wonderful level of protection for them. And so it's just more than more than just rocks. There's a lot going on there. Yes. And you could easily, if you've got one of these in your yard or in your community, have, like we've been talking about, some amazingly beautiful plants and interesting plants. And I mean, carnivorous plants are just cool uh, when you get into that aspect of it as well. I mean, there's, I'm, I'm still a little kid when you come to carnivorous plants and ooh, part of it, because those are just so Awesome. You think of bogs, you know, you think of a bog or, you know, a nitrogen poor environment, because that would be the evolutionary reason for a plant actually uh, feasting on the body of uh, another organism would be right. It would be the nitrogen because they can make all the sugar they want. They're still green uh, and photosynthesizing. But that is, I think that is so fascinating. I'm not familiar with our glades having any uh, of these little sundews. Are you, Shannon? I'm not, but it's something I want to look into more because I just, I'm at the point with my knowledge of the glades that I know that I don't know enough to know that. So that's one of the things that I want to look into more and see if the glades around here have those sorts of connections with them as well and plus I want to learn some more about some of the glades in other areas too so I may have to have other conversations with people who like you but are in other parts of the country that have other types of glades because people who listen to me regularly know that I am always curious and wanting to learn more I think that'd be fun to do I think that that is the sign of somebody who will always be um, bright and curious is you're always going to be happy, Shannon. <laughs> this has been a fun conversation and hopefully people have learned a lot about glades or at least have gotten curious about glades. And that's really what I wanted to do with this episode was just introduce the idea of glades to people and the idea that thin rocky soil that everybody complains about when you've got it, it might be not just a challenge and a problem, but something cool and interesting that is worthy of getting curious about and learning some more about. But yes, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. And if people have more questions or want to learn more about cedar limestone glades, especially in that middle Tennessee area, can they contact you? Oh, please do. I, I definitely welcome uh, email questions. I'll be traveling for a few weeks, but always happy to either forward your email on to somebody who I think may be able to answer your questions or I'll, I'll respond to you. Okay. So that's wonderful. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. And, um, and thank you so much for, for being curious, Shannon to ask me about cedar glades, Lebanon limestone cedar glades. Oh, you're welcome. And like I said, thanks for coming on here. And I will have links in the show notes to 
the Center for Cedar Glades Studies website through MTSU, Middle Tennessee State University. And then also I'll have your email address if people want to send you an email and say, hey, what's this? Or I want to know more. And like you said, so that you can kind of point them in the right direction and help them out. That would be great. Okay. Well, thanks again for talking with us and have a great day. And you the same, Shannon. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. I appreciate Kim taking the time to talk with us today. I really do think Glades are fascinating places. And the more time I spend in them, the more I want to learn about them. I find it kind of ironic that where I'm from, our glades are often referred to as cedar glades. Yet, cedar encroachment due to fire suppression is one of the main threats to glades. That's a topic that Kim and I barely touched on in our conversation. I definitely think there might be more glade-related episodes sometime in the backyard ecology future. Before I wrap this up, I want to ask a favor of you. If you find value in the Backyard Ecology content, please consider making a donation. You can find out how at www.backyardecology.net slash support. Until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.